Hi and welcome to this on maths prediction for the AQA Maths GCSE Foundation Paper 2. Enjoy! Hi and welcome to this on maths prediction. So I hope the um, first paper went alright for you. Um, this is obviously a prediction for paper 2. Um, now with this prediction I'm filming it before um, paper 1 is out, before I've seen paper 1. Um, if I look at the uh, Edexcel paper and I need to update uh, anything I will try and, and endeavour to do that but um, obviously the exam is on Thursday so it's going to be quite um, a time constraint um, but I'll try my best to get something out. Um, now like paper 1 this is a skills prediction, it's only going to be um, questions that are what we call AO1, so the basic questions, which makes up about 40 to 50% of the test, um, which means that all of your other revision, which I'm sure you have been doing, is even more important using, using this resource. The feedback um, I've already um, seen from uh, paper one, uh, which for me was just now, um, is that people found this really helpful and there were quite a few times where questions that came up on this skills prediction um, it came up in the paper, so that's really good to see. The good thing about the skills prediction is I'm able to do a whole wide, much wider range of topics um, to help you guys out. Um, so please continue giving me uh, feedback on that. Um, and if you know, hopefully not, but if um, you have to resit again in uh, June, um, then I'm hoping to do the same thing then and maybe expand on it further. So feedback is, is really, really helpful. Um, as always, this is available on the site. If you go to onmaths.com, and I'm sure a link will appear up there now uh, to click on it, it's completely free of charge. You don't need to sign up at all. You can just get started straight away. If you choose to sign up, then it will save your scores. And there's some other things on the site as well. Um, like our demon questions and mini mocks and and topic based uh, questions. So if if you're not if you're struggling on a specific topic, they're all on the site. So if you go to the search bit on the site, you can type in any topic you want, and we've got questions on it. Um, so please do visit the site. If you like this video, please click like. And if you want to be the first to know about any of our future videos, including paper three predictions, then please click subscribe. I hope you enjoy the video. Thank you. Okay, so in this question we're asked to find the fraction of the shape that's shaded. So in total we've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 that are shaded. And we've got 8, 9, 10 squares in total. So the fraction is going to be 7, the amount shaded, over 10, which is the total amount of squares. Okay, it's really important for the GCSE that you understand the two-dimensional and three-dimensional names of shapes. Um, so this one is a cylinder, but there's no way of working out um, without just sitting and learning them. And there's some great posters out there and some great revision resources that just go through the names of the shapes. Mode just means most common, so when you're asked for the mode for a list of numbers, you just write down the one that comes up the most. Now, most of you will recognize this straight away, but something that might help is putting them in order of size, because sometimes you can spot the mode a little bit easier, and you can see here that seven comes up the most. You don't need to put them in order of size, but sometimes it can help, so the mode is seven. So this question is asking us to convert worded numbers into just numbers. So it says 2,605. So when we're thinking about numbers, we think about what column each of the digits are in. So we have our units column here. We have our tens column here. We have our hundreds here. And we have our thousands here. So we have 2,000, so I can put a 2 in here. 600. Now, it doesn't say any 10s. If it said 35, I could put a 3 in the 10s column, but there's no 10s in that number, so I'm just going to put a 0. And 5. Now, when you look at that number, you think, oh, that's 2,605, and that's what it says in the question. So that's our answer. 
Okay, so this is a calculator question. First thing I'm going to do is type in 0 0.3 in the calculator. And then I'm going to look for a button that looks like this. Now, some calculators show it slightly differently. So if you are not sure, you can ask a teacher. You could also press this button. And again, some calculators look slightly differently. And this just allows you to type in the power that you want. So you then press 2. So I'm going to press the x squared button and press equals. Now, it might show up as a fraction. You might need to press the s to d button which looks something like this on the Casio calculators. Again, other calculators, might, it might look different. And it's getting me the answer of 0 0.09. Okay, so we're asked to solve, which means find out what x is. So I'm going to put my lines in first of all. Now, what we need to do is find a number that we add 5 to to get to 17. And the way we do that is we figure out what is on the left-hand side we don't want. Well, we don't want this plus 5. What we're going to do next is we're going to do the opposite of that to both sides to get rid of it from the left hand side. So the inverse operation or the opposite of plus 5 is take away 5. So on the left hand side we've got rid of it, so we're just left with x. And on the right hand side we have 17 take away 5, which is going to be 12. So my answer is x equals 12. And we can check that by putting it into the original equation, 12 plus 5 is 17. All right, so we're asked to find 8.9% of 457. Um, so first of all, I'm just going to convert 8.9% into a decimal. So this is it as a percentage, and as a decimal, I'm just going to divide it by 100. And you always do that to percentage just to find decimals. So 8.9 divided by 100, and that gives me 0 0.089. And all I need to do is get my quantity and times it by that decimal. So I'm going to times that by 457 equals, and it says 40.673, and it wants it to two decimal places, so that's going to be 40.67. Okay, the first thing to do with this question is realize that we've got meters in our diagram and we're going to construct a diagram using centimetres. So the first thing I would do is just convert all these lengths uh, into centimetres. So that's going to be 300 centimetres, 500 centimetres, 100 centimetres, and 600 centimetres. And next thing to realise is we have a scale, and the scale says 100 in real life is 1 on our diagram. So to get from real life to the diagram, we're going to divide by 100. And that's what I'm going to do with each of these lengths. So 300 divided by 100 is 3, this one's going to be 5, and then 1, and then 6. Okay, and let's start drawing the diagram. Now, I'm going to start off at the bottom, the top uh, left, and I know I'm going to go 6 down, so I'm going to start off doing that. So we're going to go 6 down from that point, and let's line it up a bit better. So 1, 2, 3, 4. Five, six, and the reason we go six down is it says it's a centimeter grid, so it's going to be six squares. We go three to the right here, and then it says we go five down. So one, two, three, four, five. Then we're going to go one across. So we're currently here, and we've just got to figure out what we're going to do next. Well, we've gone five down, and we need to go six down in total, so we need to go another one down. Uh, we've got one to the left, but we need to go three to the left for us to to get all the way. So it's going to be two there. So we're going to go one down to line it up with the other length that we've already done. And we're going to go two left to complete the shape. And that's it. Uh, always try and just make sure you check the diagram. You can see on this diagram it looks nothing like the diagram um, they've shown uh, above. Okay, it looks nothing like that shape, but that's fine uh, because that's not drawn to scale. We have drawn a diagram to scale. So we're asked to find the medium from this stem and leaf diagram. And the good thing about uh, stem and leaf diagrams is that it automatically puts the uh, numbers in order of size. So the first thing with a median is to put them in order of size, so we don't need to do that. But we still need to find the middle one. Now, there's two ways of doing this. There's um, find out how many numbers there are. Uh, add 1 to it, divide by 2 and find that, that number. 
um, but I'm going to just do the crossing out method. So I'm going to cross out the smallest, which is 31 here, and the biggest, which is 66. Then I'm going to cross out the second smallest, which is 40, and the second biggest, which is 65. And I'm just going to keep doing that until I'm left with either one or two in the middle. Now, in this case, I'm left with two in the middle, which is the 57 and the 58. So when that happens, you add them together and divide by two. Or you can just find out the halfway number. Now, halfway between 57 and 58 is going to be 57.5. Okay, so to round numbers to two decimal places, I always write the number out so I've got plenty of space. And I draw a line after two numbers past the decimal point, so the line goes here. Now, all these numbers here are doomed, but before they go away, that number decides whether that 7 gets promoted to an 8 or stays at a 7. The choices are... If that's 5 or more, it pushes the number to the left up, or if it's 4 or less, it stays the same. So because that's a 5, that pushes the 7 up, so it's 8.18. .8. But all the rest of the numbers turn to 0. Now because they're past the decimal point, we don't bother writing them. So the answer is 8.18. The easiest way of doing factors is try and come up with pairs of numbers that multiply together to make 30. Now, it's easy to start. I always start with 1 times the number, so 1 times 30. Then I try 2, uh, 2 times 15, so that works. Then 3 times 10. Now, I'm going to try 4. Now, 4 isn't, doesn't go into 30, so that one I can cross out. So let's keep going. 5 times 6. Now, the next one would be 6 times 5, but we've already got the 5 and the 6 down, so we can stop there. So the factors are 1, 2, 3, 5, 6, 10, 15, and 30. So, to simplify this, we've got to remember that 4a just means 4 times a, and 9b just means 9 times b. So we can get the 4 times the 9 together, but it doesn't matter which way around we multiply things. Now, we know that 4 times 9 is 36, and we don't show the time sign in algebra, so it's 36ab, and that's our answer. Okay, so we're asked to write 5 over 9 as a percentage. Now, to get from uh, fractions to percentages, we want to do is get to a decimal first. So, to get from a fraction, which at the moment is 5 over 9, to a decimal, all you just do is 5 divided by 9, because over just means divide. So, I'm going to do that in the calculator. 5 divided by 9, and it comes up with 0 0.555, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Now, to get to a percentage, all we do is we times the decimal by 100. So 0 0.555, blah, blah, blah. I'm going to keep it in the calculator, and I'm going to times it by 100. So times by 100. And that gives me 55.55, blah, blah, blah. And to the nearest percent, well, this 5 here is going to push the, the 5 here up by 1. So it's going to be 56%. So to get from a fraction to a decimal, you just divide top and bottom, and to get from a decimal to a percentage, you times by 100. Okay, so 450 people asked whether they'd like to watch a new film, and these are shown in the pie chart here. And it says, uh, how many people responded to the question with no? So the first thing I'll do is work out what fraction people said no. So it's 140 degrees, and it's out of 360. So that's the fraction of people that said no. Now it says there's 450 people, so I get that fraction, and there's no need to cancel it, because it's a calculator question, and times it by 450. Find out that fraction of 450. So fraction button, 140 over 360, times 450. 
and I get the answer of 175, which sounds about right. If you have a look at it, it's about a third roughly, um, and 175 is roughly a third of 450. So for this question, we're just adding like terms. We've got 13x and we've got a 7x. So we add them together. So we've got 13 lots of x and we're adding 7 lots of x. So that gives us 20 lots of x. Now students sometimes write 20x squared. We don't have any x squareds here. And what the student's doing is they're timesing or multiplying the x's together. We've just got 13 lots of x and we're adding 7 lots of x, therefore we've got 20 lots of x. Okay, so there's a couple of ways to draw this graph onto this grid. First of all, we could use uh, the y-intercept method, where you plot this on the y-intercept, and then you use the gradient, so go across 1 and down 2, and then across a oh, right 1, another down 2, or you could just find values. So is it minus 2x plus 8? So we've got three values there. So it's minus 2x plus 8. And we're going to do minus 2 first. So y equals minus 2 times minus 2 plus 8. Now two negatives times together is a positive. So that's 4 plus 8, which equals 12. Then we're going to do it for this one. So y equals minus 2 times 0 plus 8. Or well, minus 2 times 0. Anything times 0 is 0. So it's going to be 0 plus 8. So that's just going to be 8. And then we've got the last one. So y equals minus 2 times 2 and then plus 8. Now negative times positive is a negative. 2 times 2 is 4. And so that's going to be 4. So we've got three points here, and whenever we have three points, we can just plot them. So minus 2 is at 12, so we can plot that. Uh, 0 at 8, so we plot it. And 2 and 4. And hopefully, if we've done this right, it should make a straight line. So let's see if I can get this done right. Oh, click the wrong one. And there we go. And you always make sure that the line is for the duration of the graph and make sure you label it. So that's y equals minus 2x plus 8. OK, so we're going to increase 840 by 11.2 percent and this will be on the calculator paper. So to start off, I would start off with 100 percent and we're increasing it by 11.2 percent. So we're going to add 11.2 percent onto that. So we're going to end up with 111.2%, okay, which is 100% plus 11.2%. Okay, the problem is that 111.2% is a bit useless to us on the calculator, so we need to convert it to what we call a multiplier, or basically a decimal. So we're going to divide it by 100, and we always divide by 100, so it's 1.112. Now, the bit here where we start off with 100%, is always the same and the bit here where we divide it by 100 is always the same so if you increase it by 9.4 percent all of this would be the same apart from it would be 109.4 percent and then when we divide that by 100 it would be 1.094 instead okay now the beauty of this multiplier is all we need to do is get the amount which is 840 and on our calculator, times it by 1.112, times it by the multiplier, and it does all the hard work for us. So I'm going to get my calculator now, 840 times 1.112, and it gives me the answer of 934.08. Now it says it wants it to two decimal places, this already is two decimal places, so this works out perfectly. Okay, so we know this is a trapezium because it has um, two parallel lines and it's four sides, therefore it's definitely a trapezium. And the formula for a trapezium is basically get add the two bases together, um, then halve it, and then times it by the height. Now the height is the thing that is hitting both of the bases, which are the parallel lines, at 90 degrees. So there's 90 degrees here, 90 degrees here, so this is our height. 
the two bases are the two parallel lines. So that's base number one, and this is base number two. So it's like a rectangle that has two bases. On a normal rectangle, you do base times height, but when it has two bases, you just work out the average of both the bases. So to work out the area, we're going to add together the two bases, the 8.7 and the 5.3, and then we're going to halve it to find out what the average of those two things are. It's like the mean. You add them together, there's two of them, so therefore you divide them by two. Then we go times it by the height. So I'm going to get my calculator out. I'm going to do uh, 0.5 brackets, 8.7 plus 5.3, close brackets, times 2.4. And I get the answer of 16.8. Now, if it asks to two decimal places, I should really put a zero there as well. All right, this question says there are only four colours in the box, and it gives us the four. Well, it gives us the probabilities of three of them: the blue, red, and white. Now we know that all of these added together have to equal one. So what we want to do is start off with the one and take away all the probabilities that we know. So the blue the red, the white, and when we do that, that will leave us with the yellow. So on the calculator, 1 take away brackets 0 0.09 plus 0 0.13 plus 0.18. And that gives me the answer of 0 0.6. Now if you don't have a calculator, it might be easier just to make these all percentages. So 100% take away 9% plus 13% plus 18% and that will give you 60% which is 0 0.6 as a decimal. So my answer is 0 0.6. Okay, so we've got a real life graph here and we're asked to interpret the gradient. So first of all we need to figure out what the gradient is. The gradient is how much y changes for every change in x and to calculate it you just work out how much y has changed between two points um, which is 12 here and work out how much x has changed which is 10 and the gradient is the change in y over change in x y has changed 12 x has changed 10 therefore that's going to be 1.2 and so our interpretation is that for every one mile you pay one pound twenty okay so uh, you pay one pound twenty per mile so the gradient always says for every one of these how much of these are there so for every one mile there is one pound twenty of pipe payment. Okay, so this question seems quite simple, but it's not as simple as it looks. So we've got meters over seconds or meters per second, and we've got kilometers per hour. Now, to get from meters to kilometers, um, we divide by a thousand, and that's nice and easy. Okay, so if we had a thousand meters, that would be one kilometer. Now, to get from seconds to hours, we divide by 60 uh, to work out how many minutes it is, and then we divide by 60 again. So in total, we divide by 3,600. But because it's at the bottom of the fraction, divisions turn into times. Okay, So we'd actually end up timesing it by 3,600 because it's at the bottom of the fraction. All right. So every time we divide the bottom of the fraction by a number, we're technically timesing the whole fraction by a number as well. So we get the 95, and we're going to divide it by 1,000, then times it by 3,600. And you can just use your calculator. So 95 divided by 1,000 times 3,600. And we get the answer of 342 kilometers per hour. Now, it would be alarming if uh, 95 meters per second, which is pretty quick, 
But if that ended up being 300 million blah, blah, blah kilometers per hour, which is just an unreasonably uh, large number. So meters to second to kilometers per hour should be kind of in the same ballpark. Uh, so 95 to 342, the numbers are in kind of the same uh, region of scale. Okay, so for this question, we are not really given a bearing um, at all. We're told that there's 98 degrees here, but that's not on bearing. Um, however, we can use that 98 degrees to find the bearing that's asking us for. The second important thing to realize in this question is it's asked for this bearing of the cinema from the train station. So we're at the train station and we're looking for the angle um, at the cinema, or the angle of the cinema. So we're looking for this angle here, which is the bearing of the cinema from the train station. So we first of all realize that all northern li all north lines are um, parallel. So we use the fact that we have parallel lines. And if that's 98 at the top right there, this is going to be 98 here. And the reason for that is that they are alternate angles. Um, therefore, if that's 98 and the whole thing, this whole thing here is a straight line, all I need to do is do 180, take away 98. So we're doing 180, take away that 98 to work out the angle, which is 82 degrees. So that's 82 degrees there, which is the bearing. But the most important thing we realize with bearings, no, nah, actually it's not that important. However, um, you could lose marks if you don't do it, is they have to be three figures. So we have to put a zero before that if it's less than 100. So it's 0, 082 degrees. Okay, so we've got quite a big uh, two-way table to complete. So the first thing I'll look at is the fact that these two here have to add together to make the 29. So this is going to have to be 11. Um, then what else can I do? I know that these two here will add together to make 15. So that's going to have to be 3. Um, I know that these three here will add together to make 11. So, so far they make 5, so I need another 6 to get that 11. Um, then next, I know these two here will add together to make the total, so that's going to be 7. Uh, these three here will add together to make that 29. So 15 plus 7 is 22, so I'll need another 7 uh, to get to 29. And then finally, I know these two here will add together to make 7, so that's going to have to be 5. And let's just check it. Um, so what can I check? I can check that these three here add together to make that 18. So uh, 5 plus 12 is 17, plus 1 is 18. And I think that is it. And I just check the numbers, they all look fantastic. Okay, so we're asked to find the next term for the sequence. The most important step we do is work out what sequence it is. So we have to add uh, 4 to get from 3 to 7. And then we add 3 to get from 7 to 10. Then we add 7. And then we add 10. It doesn't seem to be making an awful lot of sense until you realize that the 10 there is the 10 there and that the 7 there is the 7 there and the 3 there is the 3 there and that screams out to me Fibonacci. Now Fibonacci means you add the 3 and the 7 together to get the 10 then the 7 and the 10 together to get the 17. You add the two previous terms so 10 plus 17 is 27. So to get the next one, we need to do 17 plus 27, and that's going to be 44. So the next term is 44. Okay, the way of approaching these questions is draw yourself a quick number line, put the number in the middle, 12. Now, what would the next one down be? Well, it's to the nearest kilogram, so the next one down could have been 11. 
If it was slightly higher, what's the next one up? Well, 13. Now, to find the lower bound, or the smallest possible weight, all that is, is the halfway point between what it could have been, the next one down, and what it was. So the halfway point is 11.5. So that is the lowest weight it could have been. Because if it was slightly more, 11.4, it would have rounded to 11. Okay, so there's quite a few different ways of working this out. I'm going to use the grid method. Now, all of these methods rely on the fact that you are multiplying the first everything in the first bracket by everything in the second bracket. I'm going to copy the first bracket at the top, so it's going to be x, and we've got a 2, and the right-hand bracket down the side, so it's x and minus 12. And we're going to times everything, so x times x is x squared, 2 times x is positive 2x, uh, x times minus 12 is minus 12x, and minus 12 times minus 2 is a positive times a negative, so it would be a negative, and 2 times 12 is 24. Now these two x terms here will add together, so we're going to end up with x squared, so what is it 2x plus minus 12x, so that's going to be minus 10x minus 24. Okay, so in this question we're asked to find the density. So the first thing that I'm going to do is just do my little triangle for density. So density equals uh, mass over volume. So to work out density, it's going to be mass divided by volume. Okay, so we need to work out the uh, mass, which it's given to us in the question here. So that's going to be quite easy. And I need to work out the volume. So to work out the volume of a prism, which the shape is, we're going to do the uh, area of the cross section times the length. Now let's have a look at the shape. The cross section is a triangle. Um, of base 3 and height 14. So area of a triangle is half times base times height. And the length is going to be how 3D the prism is, which is 5. So we're going to times it by 5. So I'm going to type that into my calculator. 0 0.5 times 3 times 14 times 5. And I get the answer of 105. So to work out density, I'm going to do the mass, which is 246, over the volume, which is 105. So 246 divided by 105, and I get a very long answer, 2.3428, blah, 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 blah. It says to do decimal places, so 2.34 grams per centimetre cubed. Now, the grams was the unit of mass, which was given to us in the question, and the centimetres cubed is the volume because all of the units were centimeters so the volume will be centimeters cubed and that's it okay for this question we just need to remember um, what the formula is for area of a circle so the area equals pi times r squared now it gives us the area which is 706.86 and it's asked us for the radius. So this is going to need some rearranging. So I'm going to put my lines going down. So the first thing I'm going to do is divide both sides by pi. Okay, so get my calculator out. 706.86 divided by pi. And it gives me the answer 225.000 blah blah blah. And I'm going to leave that into my in my calculator. And now that gives us r squared. Now to get rid of the squared, we need to square root both sides. So I'm going to square root answer. And it gives me 15.000 blah blah blah. And that's r. Now it says it needs it to the nearest integer. Now integer just means whole number. So to the nearest whole number, that's just going to be 15. Now I can check that by doing pi times 15 squared. And it gives me the answer of 706.85834. So chance are it's right. Now a lot of people look at the word estimate and think, oh, let's just take a guess at it. The reason we're estimating is because of the first step that we have to do to answer this question. It doesn't mean that just have a 
quick punt and guess at it. With this question, you won't be able to guess it correctly, or it'd be very, very unlikely. So we approach this the same as if it wasn't a group. However, we do have a group, so we've got to do a step first. This means that we've got a value somewhere between 0 and 4, uh, including 4 but not including 0. Now the problem is that the first step in this method is to multiply these two numbers together, but you can't times somewhere between 0 and 4 by 14. So what we need to do first is find the midpoint. The reason we pick the midpoint is it's a good number to use to represent that group. If we assumed all those numbers were 0, then it would probably be ridiculously small. If we assume they were all 4, again it would be too high. So we assume that all those are 2 because it's right in the middle of the group and chances are that most of them are closer to 2 than 0 or 4. So we find the midpoint of each of the groups and a way of doing this is just adding the lowest and highest value together and dividing it by 2. Or just having a look, 4 to 8 will be 6, 8 to 12 halfway will be 10, uh, 12 to 16 halfway will be 14, and 16 to 20 halfway will be 18. Then what we do is we get the frequencies and times them by the midpoints. So it's the same as if it wasn't a group now. So we do 14 times 2, which is 28, 6 times 6 is 36, 3 times 10 is 30, and then you can use a calculator for this, so 9 times 14. I have an idea of what it's going to be. Hopefully it's 126, which it is, good. And 2 times 18, which is 36. And this is our, I call this the fx, although in this case we are calling the first one s, so it's the fs column. And then we need to find the sum of the fs column. So we're going to add up 28, 36, 30, 126, and 36 in the calculator, which is 256. And then we're going to sum up the frequencies, which is this column here. So 14 plus 6 plus 3 plus 9 plus 2, which is 34. And then what we're going to do is we're going to get the 256, which is all our values added together and divide it by 34. So 256 divided by 34. And I get the answer of 7.5294 blah blah blah. And two decimal places, that's going to be 7.53. Now the reason it's an estimate, as I've said before, is that we don't know that all the values in the first group are 2. Uh, we are estimating them to all be 2, even though we know that some of them will be 1, some of them will be 3. But chance it will balance out that it's roughly going to be about 2 in that group, and 6 in the next group, and 10 in the group after. That's where the word estimate comes. Um, the method for doing this uh, is, is how I've shown it here. I don't believe there's any other methods you can use for this. So we have two spinners. Spinner 1 has three outcomes and spinner 2 has 7. So we're looking for the total amount of outcomes. So if we start writing down the outcomes, it might become obvious how many there will be. So I'm going to start with A and a 1. Then I'm going to stick with A and go for 2. So A2 and then A3. And you can quickly see that there's going to be 7 of those. So 7 outcomes with A. And I do the same with B. And again, you can see that there's going to be seven outcomes with B. And we do the same with C. And there's going to be seven of those. C4, 5, C6, and C7. So all together, there are seven with A, seven with B, and seven with C. So if we've got three outcomes on spinner 1, and seven outcomes on spinner 2, all we need to do is multiply them together and it shows us how many outcomes there are in total. So the answer is going to be 21. Okay, so to draw this graph, we're going to use our table of values, um, which is shown below. Um, so when x equals 2, what I want to type into my calculator is 2 squared minus 2 plus 10. And it's exactly the same as the equation at the top, but instead of x, it's going to be 2. 
Um, now I can do this in my head. 2 squared is 4, 4 take away 2 is 2, and 2 plus 10 is 12. Um, we're going to do this for the other one. So when x equals 1, we'll do 1 squared take away 1 plus 10. 1 squared is 1, so 1 take away 1 is 0, plus 10 is 10. Um, then when x uh, when x is 0, just going to be 0 squared take away 0 plus 10, which is obviously going to be 10. Now when x is negative 1, we've got to be careful. If you type this into your calculator, make sure you put any negatives in brackets, otherwise it will get that wrong. So minus 1 squared is 1. If you don't put it into brackets, the calculator will assume that it's minus 1, because uh, it will square the 1 first and then put a minus before it. Minus minus makes us a plus. So that's going to be 12. And when x is negative 2, it's going to be negative 2 squared minus negative 2 plus 10, which is 4 plus 2 plus 10, 4 plus 2 is uh, 6, plus 10 is 16. Okay, let's plot this onto our graph, so it's 16, uh, was it 12, 10, 10, and 12. Okay, so next we need to um, join these up. Now, um, there's a few rules for joining up a quadratic. Uh, it needs to be a U rather than a V. Um, if you've got two points at the bottom, which we do, you need to make a point to go beneath them uh, at the bottom of the curve, and it's got to be one line rather than feathering or a couple of lines, or you, oh, oops, I've made a mistake, so I'll do it again, okay? So I'm going to try my best here to join these up. I'm not fantastic at this, but should be all right. Now be careful here to go beneath those two points. Now up like that, and that should be fine. So it's this part here, you've just got to make a point to go beneath those two points. If you draw a line straight across, you will lose a mark. Now there are other ways of doing this question, but I'm going to be using the multiplier method, which I think is the easiest method to use, and the most versatile. So, we are starting with a 5.6% increase in money, because that's what compound interest is. And then we're moving to a 3.1% interest, uh, or raise in money. So to use the multiplier method, you always start off with 100%. You do what it's saying, so if it's adding 5.6, we're going to add 5.6%. Obviously if you take away, it's take away, which gives us 105.6%. And then what you do is you make that a multiplier by just dividing it by 100 Multiply is just a posh way of saying decimal, 1.056. Could do the same with the 3.1%. So we start off with 100%. We're increasing by 3.1%. So we end up with 103.1%. Then we do 103.1%. Divide it by 100. Make it a decimal, 1.031. Now the simple thing with multipliers is you get the amount which is 500 you times it by the first multiplier then you times it by the second multiplier and that's it so i get my calculator i type in 500 times 1.056 times 1.031 and it gives me the answer of 544.368 now with money obviously you need to round it, so it's £544.37. So what some of you might be thinking is, well don't we need to add on the extra, add on the additional £500 each time that we work out 5.6% or 3.1%. This one here and this one here ensures that the answer we have is the total answer including the £500. Okay, so we're asked to find the length of the line AB, and the way of doing this is you work out how far across you go and how far up you go, and by doing that you create a right angle triangle. 
So we go two across here, two jumps across. And if you don't know that that was two, let's do a different method. So to get this other one, one, two, three jumps up. Or you just know that it goes up to four, down to one, four take away one is three. So it's a right angle triangle with sides two and three, and we're looking for the third one. Now, the one opposite the right angle is going to be labeled as C. These two, it doesn't matter, I'm going to call that A and that B. We use Pythagoras's formula. So A squared plus B squared equals C squared. And A is two, so two squared plus three squared because B is three equals C squared. Let's put our lines in. So it's going to be four plus nine equals C squared. 13 equals C squared. Square root both sides. And let's get my calculator. So square root of 13 is 3.6055 blah 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 equals C. So it's two decimal places. It's 3.61. Now be careful. Sometimes it will say that it's done on centimeter square grid. So you might have a unit attached. If you want to put units but it doesn't say any, you can just write uh, 3.61 units. Right, so we're given a Venn diagram of items of clothes people are wearing and it's split between blue and red and obviously neither on the outside. And it says a person is selected at random, find the probability the person's wearing a red item of clothing. Now red is both of these values here, so we need to add them together. So 7 plus 4 is 11 and we need to have that out of the total amount in the Venn diagram. That is all of these numbers together. So we've got 11 so far, plus the 10 is 21, plus the 2 is 23. So my answer is 11 over 23. Okay, to start off, um, when you're working out the nth term, you've got to work out what the sequence is going up in. Now this is a bit weird, this one, because it's going down. But we've still got to work out what's going up in. So it goes up by negative 3 each time. And you always check that it continues, which it does. This number then goes before the letter n. So it's minus 3n. The next step is you go backwards 1 and find out what the zeroth term is. So the zeroth term here is going to be 20, because 20 take away 3 is 17. And this we add on to the end here. So it's minus 3n plus 20. And always check it. So for the first one, n is 1. So minus 3 times 1 is minus 3. Plus 20 is 17. For the fifth term, minus 3 times 5 is minus 15. Minus 15 plus 20 is 5, which is our fifth term. Okay, so for this question, we need to change this so that it's a 1 on the left-hand side. So we've got to think, right, how do we get that 1? Well, we get that 21 and we divide it by 21. And if we're dividing the left-hand side by 21, we've got to also divide the right-hand side by 21. So we get our calculator out and we type in 4 divided by 21. And we'll write this as a decimal. 0 0.1904 blah 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 and it says it wants it to two decimal places so our answer is going to be 1 to 0 0.19 okay this question doesn't seem like it gives us very much information but actually it gives us all we need we need to know it's a regular polygon which it says it is we've got the interior angle of 170 so if I imagine um, I've got my uh, polygon here and this is a part of the polygon obviously the polygon continues up here and across there and we know that the exterior angle so this one here would be useful the interior angle here is 170 degrees so to get the exterior angle all we do is 180 take away 170 which is 10 degrees and that's for the exterior angle. So if the exterior angle is 10 degrees, we know all exterior angles add up to 360. So we do 360 divided by 10, because each one is 10 degrees. 
and I don't need my calculator for that. I know that that's just going to be 36. So there's going to be 36 sides of that. So if you're given an interior angle on a regular polygon, just take it away from 180 degrees to find the exterior angle, and then do 360 divided by the exterior angle to find how many sides the polygon has. Okay, so we're asked to draw a reciprocal graph. Uh, so it's 1 over x plus 8. And I'm just going to go through um, each of the x uh, coordinates and find out what the y's are and then plot them on the graph. So I'm going to put, start with 5. Um, so it's 1 fifth plus 8, which will be 8 and 1 fifth. So it will be just above the 8. Um, then uh, a quarter plus 8 is 8 and a quarter. That will be just slightly higher still. Uh, a third plus 8 would be 8 and a third, so slightly higher still. Um, half plus 8 is 8 and a half, which should be just about here maybe. Uh, 1 plus 8 is 9, which would be here. And then half, uh, a 1 over a half plus 8, which would be 10. And then as you get closer and closer to 0, so if I and put in 1 over a tenth plus 8, that would be 18. So we get quite high quite quickly there. Um, and so uh, looking at the other side, uh, minus 4, uh, so 1 over minus 4 plus 8, so that would be 8 take away a quarter. So it will be just under 8. And same thing for this side. And it half would be um is it two uh minus two plus eight which would be six. So it'd be there and then it would be uh about there. Okay. So what it will end up looking like a reciprocal graph, it will look like this and this. Okay. But because we've had the plus eight, <clears throat> it will move up eight. So it will be in line with the 8 here, which it is. So we now need to join these up with one smooth curve, which is not easy on here. So make sure I go through all the points. And let's try with the other side. Probably try and start at the bottom. No, that was rubbish. Let's try again. Okay, that's not bad. That's probably as good as I can do on this machine. Um, the scales on this aren't perfect. Um, on the exam, I think you'll get a, a much nicer scale to be able to plot them, um, and it should be a, a lot easier. Okay, so in this question, we know a company is going to increase or has increased the number of chocolates in the bag by 15%. The bag now contains 69 chocolates and we've got to work backwards to find out what originally you had. So the best way of doing this is think about um, what uh, you would do if you were given the original amount and then we just need to do the opposite of that. So we first of all want to find out the multiplier, so we start off with 100%. We increased it by 15% and we now have 115%. And we want to convert that to a multiplier, so 115% divided by 100 is going to be 1.15. So that's our multiplier. So the step you'd now do if you were given the original is you'd get that original amount, which we don't know, and you would times it by the multiplier. And you'd get the final amount, which we do know, which was 69. But we're given the final amount and we're trying to go backwards. And so what we want to do is do the inverse of this. The inverse of that is divide by 1.15 to find out what the original was. So we're working this way, and we're going to divide it by 1.15. So I'm going to get my calculator out. 69 divided by 1.15, and it gives me the answer of 60. So there were originally 60 chocolates in the bag. Now you can then do 60 times 1.15 and check it works and it comes up with the answer of 69. 
Okay, so in this question we're given a right angle triangle and we've got two lengths and an angle. Now whenever we have that, with one of those being unknown, it's going to need trigonometry. So the first step of trigonometry is to mark the uh, lengths. So I go opposite the right angle and that's going to be the hypotenuse, it's the longest side. Then I'm going to go to the marked angle and go opposite that and that actually just, just is called the opposite. And the one left over and the one between the right angle and the marked angle is the adjacent, so I'm going to mark that A. Now one of these is boring, so I need to cross it out. Well, the O is the 2.4 next to it, the A is the X next to it, the H has nothing next to it, so let's get rid of that. The next step is to write down our saw ka toa And this is something you need to remember. And it's a collection of three triangles, so ka and toa and we're going to cross out the two ones we're not going to use for this question. Well, we've crossed out the H, so saw and ka both have an H in it, so we're not going to use those. We're going to use the toa. Now, most some of you at this step will just write down tan x equals O over A and continue, and that's absolutely fine by substituting the values. I'm going to do a slightly different method. I'm just going to do a big triangle. And I'm going to put in the uh, values into this triangle. Now, T stands for tan, the angle. Well, the angle in the question is 81, so it's going to be tan 81. Okay, the O stands for opposite, which in this question is 2.4. And the A stands for uh, adjacent, so that's the X. Now, the way of using this triangle is if we've got a number at the top and a number at the bottom and the unknowns at the bottom, then to get the unknown, we do 2.4, the number at the top, divided by tan 81. So x equals 2.4 divided by tan 81. So I'm going to get my calculator. I'm going to press the fraction button. Uh, 2.4 at the top and tan 81 at the bottom. Now be careful to close the bracket. If you don't close the bracket on most calculators, you'll come up with an error. So if you get that error, just go back and put the closing bracket in after 81. And I get 0.38 um, and it's 0, 1, blah, blah. But it's two decimal places, that's just going to be 0 0.38. Now, I could add centimetres. It does have centimetres next to the X, so I don't need to, but I'm going to write it anyway. Okay, so we're given the probability that it will rain on a Monday and Tuesday. The probability it will rain on Tuesday is not affected by the probability it rains on a Monday. And we're asked to find uh, the probability it will rain once. So there's two different ways it can rain once. Starting here, it could rain on the first day, but then obviously not rain on the second day, because if it rained on the second day, it would have rained twice. Or it could not rain on the first day, and then rain on the second day, rain on the Tuesday. So we work out the probability that we end up, uh, it ends up raining on Monday, but not on Tuesday. And we just multiply the two probabilities together there. So six times two is 12, uh, two times seven is 14, so that'd be 140. Now I'm not gonna cancel that down and you'll see why in a second. Okay, so I can then work out the other probability. So it's 14, over 20, nice one, <laughs> and at times 5 uh, over 7. So we've already done the working out for the bottom, which is 140, and then we need to do 5 times 14, so 5 times 10 is 50, 4 times 5 is 20, so that would be 70. Okay, now, when you're given a choice between either it raining on the first day, on the Monday, or raining on the second day. The word or in probability means add. So you add the two probabilities that you found together. Now when we do that, we end up with 82 over 140. And because we are now ready to give an answer, because that is the correct probability, then we can start cancelling it down. So I can half top and bottom, so that would be 41 over 70. And I'm not quite sure that there's another um, way I can cancel that down. I think that's the answer. So I'm going to keep it at 41 over 70. Okay, so the important thing to realise first is that this is a part of a full circle. So 
So if I draw the full circle in, badly. Um, we've just got a slice of it. Now it asks us for the perimeter. Now there are three parts to the perimeter. There's this seven centimeters here, there's seven centimeters here, and this what we call an arc here. So we need to work out the arc first. So to work out the length of the arc, we're going to do uh, the full circumference of the circle, which is pi times the diameter. Now the diameter here is going to be 14 because the radius, the distance between the outside of the circle and the center of the circle is 7 and the diameter is twice the radius, so that's going to be 14. But that will give us uh, the whole circumference and we don't want the whole circumference, we want just this 49 degrees of it. So we need to write that as a fraction, so 49, the total in the circle is 360, therefore as a fraction that's going to be 49 over 360, and it's always over 360 because the circle always adds up to 360 degrees. So I'm going to type that into my calculator, pi times 14 times, and I'm going to press the fraction button, 49 over 360, and it gives me the answer of 5.9864 blah 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 blah. I'm going to keep that into my calculator because I haven't answered the question yet, because as I said at the start, to get the perimeter, I need to add that 5.9864 blah 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 to the 7 and the other 7 and that will give me the full perimeter. So I'm going to add 7, add 7 and it gives me 19.9864 blah 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 blah. So to two decimal places that's going to be 19.99. Well, I hope you found that video useful. As I said at the start of the video, um, please check out our website, which is up here, hopefully. <laughs> um, and you can do this paper online. Um, the ones on the website, the numbers change. The questions don't, but the numbers change. So you can try it as many times as you want. Um, if you uh, want any feedback on this, or if you want to give any feedback on this video, please click uh, down below and leave some feedback. Um, all of comments uh, I read and I try to respond to the ones that, that I'm able to um, and if you like this video please click like and if you want to be first to know about our paper 3 prediction please click subscribe. Thank you very much.